The poem My Last Duchess is a dramatic monologue, which means that the poet Robert Browning uh, is taking on the role of another character, in this case, the Duke of Ferreira, and it is only this voice that we hear throughout the lines of the poem, you know, where we get monologue from. Uh, the poem is written in uh, something called an iambic pentameter, which means that it's written in ten-syllable lines, with the stress occurring on every other syllable. And the theory behind this is that this is the best metre to use if you're trying to mimic the cadences of real speech. The effect of this is further enhanced by the use of enjambement, which means that the lines flow from one to another without any punctuation to slow the reader down. And so we have that sense of somebody talking to us in a fairly informal way. Another structural point which is worth noticing before we start is that the poem is organised into pairs of rhyming couplets. Now, before you can understand the content of the poem itself, you need to know a bit about the events that Browning imagines happening before the poem starts. So, first of all, we have a duke and a duchess, and they get married, but the Duchess dies very suddenly, and so the Duke is in search of a new wife. Now, as the head of an important and powerful family in Italy, he would have been a very popular match, and so the Duke would be able to negotiate a good dowry from the family of any prospective new wife. He would be offered land and money, while the girl would gain a title, she'd become a duchess, and so raise the status of the whole family. Now, it's in a break from one of these dowry negotiations that the action of the poem occurs. The Duke takes the envoy on a tour of his house, and you can imagine him pointing out all of the expensive sculptures and tapestries that adorn his house, before eventually standing in front of the painting of the Duke's recently dead wife. In other words, his last Duchess. That's my last Duchess, painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will please you sit and look at her? I said... Fra Pandolf, by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, and seemed as they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there. So, not the first are you to turn and ask thus, sir. "'Twas not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the Duchess's cheek. "'Perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, "'Her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, "'or paint must never hope to reproduce "'the faint half-flush that dies along her throat. "'Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, "'and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. "'She had a heart... How shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, it was all one. My favour at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bow of cherry, some officious fool broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with around the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least. She thanked men. Good. But thanked them somehow. I know not how. As if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech which... I have not to make your will quite clear to such an one and say, just this or that in you disgusts me. Here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth and made excuse, 
even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? This grew, I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will please you, rise, we'll meet the company below then. I repeat, the Count, your master's known munificence, is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. So let's have a closer look then at the first 13 lines of the poem. And we can quite quickly begin to gain an insight into the character of the Duke. He repeats the name of the artist who painted the picture several times. That we've got Fra Pandolf Hans. I said Fra Pandolf's by design. As if he's proud and showing off, almost like name dropping about having this man, this great artist's work in his house. He also draws the envoy's attention to the quality of the artwork um, in being able to reproduce the depth and passion of its earnest glance, even commenting that it's such a good painting that it looks as if she was still alive. This Certainly doesn't seem to be the voice of someone getting all choked up while looking at the picture of a loved one who has just recently died. We also learn quite early on in the poem that the Duke is obviously a very controlling person, and we learn that almost as an aside in parenthesis, which are these brackets here and here. And look at what he says, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I. The Duchess was clearly caught in a very controlling relationship and the Duke continues to exert that power and control over her even after her death. The narrative then focuses on the expression on the Duchess's face, which the Duke refers to rather unflatteringly as that spot of joy. Notice how previously the Duke was very complimentary about the reproduction of his Duchess in paint, in artistic form, but as far as the Duchess herself is concerned, not very flattering. And his view throughout the poem is that he feels that it should only ever have been he the Duke who could make his wife happy or smile. And so the Duke has a very accusatory tone when he imagines the artist's flattering remarks causing his wife to smile while the portrait was being painted, such as paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat. The fact that these flatteries were cause enough suggests that, according to the Duke at least, it was too easy to get this reaction from his wife, and that is what makes him jealous. The same idea is carried forward into this part of the poem, uh, where the Duke uh, accuses his wife of having a heart that is too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on and her looks went everywhere. And this is quite an interesting line because it appears as though the Duke is accusing his last Duchess, his previous wife, of flirtatious behaviour. And I always tell students when looking at this poem that it's really important not to trust this man's view of his wife, that you shouldn't get into thinking that this girl is a bad person, a flirtatious person who sort of got what was coming to her from this controlling man. 
He is a deeply controlling and paranoid person, and therefore he would have seen this sort of behaviour even if it wasn't there. He then goes on to list some of the things that she uh, responded equally to, such as the dropping of the daylight in the west, you know, the sun setting. If one of the workers in the orchard brought some fruit for her, the mule that she rode around the grounds on, all of these things, he says, would draw from her a like approving speech or blush at least. In other words, she would respond to all of these things equally and he does not like that because he thinks that he should be treated as special because that is how he views himself. In this part of the poem, the Duke reveals quite plainly his displeasure that the Duchess appeared to value what he regards as trifles in equal measure to the title she has inherited. Look, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. And here we have the clearest sense yet of the Duke's uh, arrogance and his narcissism. Not only do we see his pride, but also his unwillingness to condescend. He will not stoop. Uh, in other words, he will not lower himself to her level. Her behaviour will either change or he will do something more serious about it. And we can see some of his... Uh, rather clumsy attempts in the next few lines of the poem. And we can now pretty clearly imagine the Duke telling his wife, you know, just this or that in you disgusts me, here you miss or there exceed the mark. But again, the Duke feels that such discussions are beneath him. And so this section of the poem ends rather ominously with... I choose never to stoop. In, it is in uh, perhaps the final section of this poem that we see the inevitable, inevitable climax and conclusion of the Duke's controlling and arrogant behaviour. I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. The dark tone of all smiles stopped is separated by the caesura, uh, which is this full stop in the middle of the line here, uh, which sort of separates this callous echo of the beginning of the poem as if alive. And here we understand that not only has the Duke had his wife killed, but also that he did it coldly enough to be able to show off the lifelike qualities of her portrait to visiting guests. Now that the Duke has finished off uh, showing off his painting, he invites the envoy to rise, to stand, and the two of them prepare to rejoin the negotiations for his next marriage in the room below. Presumably, um, the Count who is mentioned here is the poor girl's father, and the Duke describes him as being extremely generous, using that word munificence, um, uh, with the offer that he is making for the marriage. But despite this, the Duke still reminds the envoy that if the marriage were to go ahead, then um, the Duke's fair daughter would become his object. And that word object tells you pretty much everything you need to know about the Duke's attitude towards women. He doesn't want a wife to be anything other than an obedient, subservient possession that he can show off in the same way that he would a piece of art. And it's interesting, therefore, to note the final image of the poem Neptune taming a seahorse, uh, a figure whom the Duke clearly identifies with and which represents the claustrophobic tyranny that his new wife 
will surely be condemned to.